What's up? What's up? What's up? Welcome back, everybody, to the first installment of the Late Night Show, Doctor Kojo. Uh, this is the first show of the week because I missed the Monday morning show, so I apologize for that. But we're gonna have fun tonight, and we're gonna talk about four types of depression to watch out for. Um, I came up with this list uh, a while back, and um, of course, this is. It may be oversimplification, but we're going to break down a couple types of depression um, so that way you all know how to navigate them and, and a little bit about what to do if you're experiencing any of these symptoms, right? Uh, it's not you know, medical information, right? It's just we're talking as if we're friends, right? So we'll just keep it like that. We'll keep a G and just have a good time, laugh, and uh, hopefully educate each other and learn, you know? And even though I'm teaching, I'm also here to learn from you all as well. So the way we start off this uh, show is we always start by introducing ourselves and letting people know where uh, we are. So my name is Kojo. I'm checking in from what was actually a sunny day here in Los Angeles, California. So I'm grateful for that. Um, it was rainy towards the beginning of the day, but it's been a pretty good day so far. So I can't complain. Um, and I'm ready to get into this show. Uh, and I would love to know uh, where you all are checking in from. And then we're going to get into it. Let's get it. Hey, yo, what's up, what's up, what's up? Joanna is very depressed. Joanna, hopefully we can help out with that, right? Hopefully you can learn something. Um, but hopefully hopefully I can maybe make you laugh or uh, lift your spirits up. Steven says, I watch all your videos and they've helped me better not only my life, but my daughter's as well. Thank you. See, Steven Mathers, I really appreciate you. <sighs> Can't talk. I really appreciate you, Mr. Mathers. Um, I was thinking of Eminem when I, when I saw your name, but I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, let me see where everybody's checking in from. Danielle, what's up, what's up? Kendra, one of the moderators, checking in from Pennsylvania. Shari's checking in from Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Ginger is checking in from, uh, I'm assuming, Auburn, Alabama, based off of uh, <laughs> that. Danielle's checking in from Florida. Lori, what's going on? We got Joe from Pennsylvania. Jennifer in Kentucky. Uh, Marjorie in Snowy, Ottawa. Lori, Oregon. Uh, Indiana in the house. Maryland in the house. Georgia. San Bernardino, I know where that's at. Uh, Wisconsin. Dana, what's going on? Alabama in the house. What's up, Joni? Canada in the house. New York, Florida, North Carolina, Nashville. Tighten up. Lithonia, Georgia, Central Florida, Union City, Tennessee, Bradenton. Um, Rome, what's going on? Yeah, it, it was pretty cool uh, to be at that premiere. I had never seen so many famous people all in one building. So it blew my mind. It, it, it was a good night. Aaron's Aaron from Colorado. Aaron, what's going on? DC in the house. Uh, Dallas, okay. North Carolina, um, Massachusetts. Robert, I appreciate you. New York City, St. Louis. May from Houston. May, I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. I'm happy that the videos uh, help you out. You know, as long as you all enjoy them, I'll keep posting. Johnson City, Tennessee, Chicago, Vermont, Minnesota. Uh, Ricky, what's going on? Alabama. Uh, tight, tighten up. <laughs> tighten up. All right. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Uh, Plymouth, Washington. We love you. I love you all as well. Shout out to all my people in Plymouth, uh, Washington, Philly, uh, Missouri. Missouri. Um, Charlene, thank you for um, being a survivor. Rome, Georgia, right? Okay. Michigan, California, and East, uh, San Diego, so SoCal. All right. So we have four different types of um, depression, and we're going to get into it. And uh, before we before we start, I want to say that depression is different from sadness. I think we've had this on the live stream before where we try to talk about the difference between depression and sadness, right? Sadness is an emotion that everybody experiences, right? And depression is, is you know, uh, much different. Depression is uh, it's a serious uh, condition, you know, and of course, it can lead to a lot of unfortunate outcomes, you know, suicide being one of them. But depression is something that you definitely want to handle. And a lot of people experience it. And it's one of the leading causes of disability worldwide, right? So it's important to get into the nitty gritty so we can figure out like, what's, what's actually going on, right? Because you have to diagnose the problem before you can fix it, right? So it's time to it's time to get into it. Ah, uh, Ricky, Ricky, oh, no, that's one of my depressions, uh, Ricky. Ah, you're getting ahead of me. But all right, Let's get into it. Trish, yeah, I'm I'm back. I'm I'm happy to see you all. Uh but um seasonal depression is one of my depressions, but um uh we got four. Let me start off with the first one, right? So I think it's um important to start off with the very first one. Kari, I appreciate you. Is it Carrie or Kari? I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um 
Uh, and Aaron, speaking of um, uh, this, uh, shout out to Aaron. Let me give Aaron the first love of the show, right? And I'll tell you all why. <laughs> we got to give Aaron the first love of the show because there's been an Adderall shortage or an ADHD medication shortage around the country, right? So I know pharmacists and pharmacy techs and you know, a lot of people are working hard to get people their medications. So shout out to people like Aaron who are working hard to get people their medications because um, if you take any of these medications that you've gone without, you know how important it is for you to get your medication. So shout out to Aaron. That's the first love of the show right there. That's the first love of the show. And Liz says, you're taking so long. You're taking so long. I'm taking too long. I apologize. I keep getting distracted. I keep getting distracted. Hope, thank you so much. All right, so let's get to the first one, right? Major depression, the four types of depression to watch out for. So this is when people, when you hear the term depression, this is probably what you think about, right? Major depression. So if you've ever been to a primary care doctor or a psychiatrist or um, a therapist and they give you a diagnosis of MDD, right? Major depressive disorder. So this means that for the majority of two weeks, right, uh, you'll do the following things like you may have lost interest in things that you used to enjoy doing. So let's say you love skateboarding and all of a sudden you haven't picked it up for a long time, right? That could be a sign. Um, you uh, start to isolate yourself. A lot of times people will isolate themselves. Uh, a lot of times people will, you know, rely on substances, right? And sometimes with men, as men, we tend to overwork when we're depressed um, and you know, we may rely on substances. Uh, you also may have a, a lack of energy, right? So literally just not having energy as you go throughout the day could be a sign of um, depression, major depression, right? Um, and sometimes if this is your baseline, because uh, there's different, it, it, once again, this is oversimplification. I'm trying to make it relatable for you all, but there's different types of, you know, depression where you can have a low grade depression for, you know, quite some time, right? Uh, dysthymia, and we would call that persistent depressive disorder. But for the purposes of what I'm trying to talk about right now, um, you know, loss of interest, maybe isolating yourself. Uh, you can have uh, people who, um, sometimes you have psychosis, but I don't want to confuse y'all because somebody emailed me about that. Can you have psychosis and depression? Yes, you can. But let's, let's just try and keep it as simple as possible. But yes, for the person who asked that question, it is possible, right? But loss of interest. Um, uh, also, your memory might be bad. You know, this is one thing that people don't uh, expect to see uh, or hear a lot. But a lot of times when you're depressed, your memory is not as good. So when um, I remember back in Virginia, um, during the forensic psych days, uh, working with some of the patients as they got better and as their depression um, lifted and they start to do the things that they were enjoying, you know, before uh, they were depressed, um, you would see the memory improve, like you could remember things, right? But there's this fog that comes over you when you're depressed, and it's literally hard to recall things. Like, you'll sit there, and you'll be like, um, like, it was on the tip of my tongue. I, I was going to say it, but I forgot, right? Um, and you, you might even think, oh, do I have ADHD, or am I forgetful? And I don't know. But with depression, we definitely do see that, where people really, really struggle uh, with their memory. And, you know, for the better part of two weeks, right? People are struggling with these things. Uh, and if you've gone through this type of thing, right, and you've received a diagnosis, um, you know, a lot of times you either get therapy uh, and or medications, depending on, you know, we have different scales that we use. One of them is called the PHQ-9, uh, but we have different scales that we use. And all you have to know is that you go in there, you fill out the scale if you're given the scale. Sometimes your provider may ask you these questions. So it's important to be on the lookout for some of these things. Um, and let me get some of these... Uh, comments literally have one Adderall XR left uh, whoever is Angelina's uh, pharmacist please get on it she got one Adderall left please please help out help out uh, Angelina part of the online fam um, and let me see uh, so Daniel says the memory effects are so frustrating so yes with depression is really frustrating when you feel like you can't recall things you know and all, I think one of the, the worst parts about it is like all of a sudden when you realize that your memory is not as good as it used to be then you're like why can't I remember, you know, this or that, right? And also keep in mind that with depression, it can throw off your uh, your sleeping habits, right? So sometimes people will sleep a lot, we call it hypersomnia, or you won't sleep enough, which is insomnia, which a lot of you all know. So it's important to know that 
All right, your sleeping habits may be disturbed with depression, right? Your eating habits may be disturbed. You might be eating too much, not eating enough, sleeping too much, not sleeping enough, right? So those things on top of the fact that your memory is not uh, what it used to be, uh, it can make life very, very frustrating. Um, Kari said, self-medicating uh, with alcohol. You see it sometimes. You just hit it all. That's exactly where I am. So Joanna, that's a, that's the bad news. But the good news, the good news is that you're here, right? You're still here. Um, and I'm happy to have you here, right? And uh, every day we try and get a little bit better. You know, as we learn the signs and symptoms and we go out and get professional help, right? And um, uh, let me see, name's the hardest thing during the down time. Uh, and Jessica said, mine is with we. All right, so uh, let, me, let me mention this real quick. So, you know, we don't judge anybody for what substances they use or whatever, right? But if you're somebody and you're consuming like copious amounts of marijuana, you know, your memory could be affected, your sleep could be affected, right? So, you know, sometimes we have to maybe ask a person, hey, like, you have to stop using X, Y, and Z. And then let's see if you still feel, you know, a certain way to see if it's a pressure. But sometimes it may be a, a substance that's inducing your mood to be a certain way, right? Um, but, you know, I do uh, hope that we can put more money uh, behind cannabis research in this country. Uh, so that way we can know how to educate people about it. Because sometimes, as healthcare professionals, we don't know where to go with uh, um, cannabis. Finally getting therapy on Thursday uh, after 15 months. Let's give Joanna a love of the show. The second love of the show goes to Joanna. <laughs> Shout out to the Twitch family. Shout out to the Twitch family. Congrats to you. It's really difficult to get there. It's hard to find a therapist. And it's also hard to like convince yourself that you need therapy. So uh, congratulations, Joanna. Um, we are all uh, behind you right here. We are all behind you. Um, see, uh, I feel like a walking coma every around this time. Uh, are you saying that you're struggling with your memory? And, uh, let me see, is there, uh, is there a stress related depression? My child's a genetic health issue for me. So, so Angela, also you, you, certain, certain things can make you depressed, right? So you can have physical limitations or let's say you had surgery and your body doesn't you know, work the way it used to, that could make you depressed, right? But the depression that you have, let's say you had surgery and, you know, um, let, I'm just giving an example, right? Let's say somebody had surgery and they had uh, like a leg amputated, right? That person may have depression, like major depression because they're trying to deal with, you know, they're trying to adjust, right? So this depends. Somebody could call that adjustment disorder or somebody could call it depression. This depends on what's going on for that specific uh, person, right? And uh, depression, depression is just awful regardless, at least Haley, in my opinion, but uh, it is uh, tough when you, know, you see kids. Um, and for me, it, it was tough when the worst part about healthcare for me personally was when I had somebody in front of me, a patient, and I felt like there was nothing I could do. And I, I never really felt that way. But sometimes when you're, you know, trying to find a treatment plan, you're like, dang, like, I feel like there's something I could do for this patient. Like you get frustrated because you feel like there's some more help that we could be giving you, but it's just, you know, we're just not there yet. Right. We're just not there yet. All right. And before I get to the other three, let me see what uh, Jessica is saying. Uh, how do I trust my doc? Uh, just in trying to be a drug pusher. I feel leery of the meds. He tries to prescribe. How does one decide to treat one disorder when there are multiple disorders? All right. So Jessica, good question right here. And I remember I used to ask my preceptors this question um, when I was in school, you know, I would, flip the psych hospital and I would ask the psychiatrist, I'm like, if somebody has depression, uh, depression, OCD, ADHD, BPD, uh, um, if somebody has all these conditions, like what do we treat first? How do we treat this? How do we prevent them from being on seven different medications, you know, or polypharmacy? Uh, that's what we would call in the hospital. Um, and it, it depends. It's a case by case type of thing. But uh, Jessica, what, one thing I could say is you could ask your doctor to explain why uh, they're doing something. I think that's a very elementary thing and a simple thing we can all ask our doctors to do, right? If, let's say you go in, I'm, I'm, and I'm not saying this is Jessica, right? I'm just making this up. Let's say you go into a doctor, right? Or therapist and, you know, you're talking to them and uh, they say you have depression, right? And they say, all right, we're going to give you Zoloft 50 milligrams, right? Take it uh, once a day in the morning, boom, boom. Uh, come back in uh, two, three weeks or a month. Let me know how you feel. We may adjust your dosage, right? Before a doctor walks out, before your healthcare provider walks out, it's, it's smart to ask, hey, doc, can you tell me why you put me in this medication? 
Uh, what does it do? What are the side effects? Um, you know, because you don't want folks coming back uh, a week or two later saying that they stopped the medications because, you know, they're having sexual side effects, which sometimes you see, right? So you have to, you should explain all these things. But um, I'm not saying that like your doctors and your PAs and your nurse practitioners are bad in your area, but sometimes like as healthcare professionals, we just forget to, to you know, because if, you know, you may go through the motions, you're seeing patient after patient after patient. But if your, your doctor forgets, you know, don't feel bad to say, hey, can you explain to me what this medication is? Um, and why am I taking all these different medications? Like, I, I think it's important to ask those questions. Like, why did I go from Zoloft to Celexa? Uh, why did you take me off of Exer? Why do you want me to give me lithium? You know, if you're putting something in your body, you know, you would want to talk to your doctor um, uh, about those things. Uh, and uh, Angela says, uh, I find being in nature really helpful when I'm feeling stuck in a funk. So, a a Angela, I agree. When I'm outside, I feel better. When I'm exercising, I feel better, right? Uh, and after we go through the four types of depression, we'll talk about what can be helpful for depression. But I'm a big fan of, uh, of being outside in nature. I love it. I'm a huge fan of it. And I was never really an outdoors type of uh, person, um, but I'm a huge fan of, of being out in nature. And um, so, LS, let me say this. I can't, um, no, legally, I can't, you know, recommend medications on here on this form. Um, but what I will say is that there's different types of medications that deal with different things. So let's say, you know, your boyfriend has these medical conditions, right? Like let's say three or four medical conditions, you know, based off the medications that we have, right? For example, let's say, just a quick example, um, because I can't recommend a, a specific medication, but let's say I have a patient, this is just a case study, right? I, I'm making all of this up. Uh, let's say I have a patient who comes in and uh, they uh, know they have depression and they want to start medications, right? But they have a heart condition. Then I'm thinking to myself, all right, uh, antidepressant, we need something that is cardiac friendly. So I think to myself, oh, okay, I'll go with Zoloft because I, I believe it's more cardiac friendly than other antidepressants. And I'll tell the patient, all right, Zoloft 50 milligrams, when a day, you know, take it every day, come back in, you know, two or three weeks, we'll reassess you. Uh, but this is why we're giving it to you. And this is what I think it can do for you. Uh, here are the side effects. And this is why I picked Zoloft over Prozac, Zoloft over Celexa, Zoloft over Paxil. Um, if you can get a doctor who's that detailed and just spits it out right there, I think, I think at that point we should be rolling, you know? So communication is huge. And, and look, even somebody here saying, Ask your doctor about B12 and vitamin D. So when you go in for an appointment, your doctor should run like labs on everything. Um, because if your vitamin D level is low, you could be feeling you no know, tired and weak, and you could be appearing as if you have depression, but maybe your, your levels are just off, right? So there's so many things that um, uh, <laughs> go into it. Daniel says, I like the way you explain it. Yeah, Daniel, I've practiced. I've, <laughs> I've practiced on that a couple of times, you know, so... Uh, I feel like I have my, um, you know, my elevator pitch ready, but, um, you know, it's different for the patient. So you don't want to just like, you know, have like a rehearsed thing that you say to everybody. Um, cause like it should be different per the patient. Right. All right. The second type of depression that you all should watch out for and somebody already, um, mentioned it, uh, is uh, seasonal depression. Right. So this is something that we see, uh, I guess we associated more with the winter months, but sometimes people can also, you know, have seasonal depression in the summer months, right? I don't think a lot of people know that. Um, but in the winter months, right, uh, and in the months where it's 4.35 p.m. and it's dark outside, it can be hard for people's spirits to, you know, to be up. And there are people who do sometimes take antidepressants only for a certain part of the year. There's people who will just take meds to get through, to get from late November to March, and that's perfectly fine, right? And we shouldn't be judging anybody for what they decide to do or how they choose to live their life or what medications they take. But there are some folks who may take meds for a certain period of time to help them get through a certain time that can be hard for them, right? Um, and with seasonal depression, it's really rough because sometimes, especially when it comes during the, the later parts of the year, right? It's kind of confusing confusing when um you it's kind of confusing when you are going through it right and everybody else is 
happy and enjoying Christmas and laughing outside and, you know, talking about a white Christmas. And you're like, why am I sitting here sad? You know, so and one thing that helps with seasonal depression is light therapy. Right. So sometimes it could be as simple as bringing, you know, like light around. Right. Like you see right here. I put the light here. I look more light skin. Right. But um, light can be helpful. But depending on where you live, you may not be exposed to a lot of light. You know, so uh, it could make it difficult uh, as you work through seasonal depression. All right, give me one second. Let me look at this thing real quick. Uh, you and it's trimmed down, but the uh, okay, you and it's second. I'm gonna come and look at it. Look at it. Do, 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 do. All right, so that's seasonal depression. I draw happy to have you here. Um, and uh, who else? Um, Leilani, happy to have you here. She's a moderator as well. Uh, yeah, winter blue seasonal depression. All uh, right, and before I, lemon D. Oh, that's interesting. Burnout. We've spoken about burnout before, but we will talk about it again. All right. And uh, before uh, we talk about the third type of depression, we're we're gonna talk about the third type of depression, um, and then the fourth type, uh, and then I'm gonna talk about how to to manage it. But before we do that, I have to go uh, take care of something real quick. But let me drop the third type of depression in here. And I'll let you all ask your questions about it. And then I'll come back and answer it. So just give me like one to two minutes. And then um, we will come back and talk about the third type, which is post uh, parm depression. So give me one second. I'll be right back.
All right, y'all, I am back. Make you figure. I do apologize. Let me say something real quick. To the, all right. Uh, hey, Kevin, uh, there's a video that you should be getting uh, pretty shortly. Um, if you can just check it and uh, go back and forth um, via email. Uh, I'm still on the um, Facebook live stream. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, make it figure. I'm sorry. I had to make sure that everything is okay. I had to take care of something video related. I am now back. All right, I'm now back. So where did we leave off? We were talking about postpartum depression. Uh, let me go up and see what some people said about postpartum depression before I give my thoughts on it. Um, let me see. My daughter is uh, my fifth pregnancy, first live birth. I was afraid of her and didn't touch her the first week. And I wouldn't let anyone else near her. I thought postpartum would make me hate her. They made me hate everyone else and everything. Oh, that's an interesting take. Thank you for sharing. And uh, the postpartum period is very uh, interesting because sometimes what you expect is not what you actually get. Uh, and that can be a frustrating feeling whichever way you go. Uh, and Jelena, I had postpartum depression during the peak of the pandemic. Virtual learning from my autistic daughter was a nightmare. It was tough. I made an appointment with my therapist, was able to get an Adderall. Okay. And I've been thriving ever since. <laughs> Down 41 pounds, but still have uh, good and bad days. But it's okay to not be okay. I agree. And I give you love of the show for deciding to keep, you know, moving forward. You know, you definitely get love of the show right there. And the water break, we normally do the water break at 30 minutes, but we'll do it at 35 minutes uh, because I took a little gap in there. So 35 minutes is where we'll do the water break. All right. And um, this is also very helpful to have here, especially because we're talking about uh, depression. So um, we put these disclaimers on here. But, you know, whenever I see somebody on the live stream and people come in and talk about whatever they're going through, like, I want to see you stick around. And I'd love to see you come to the next live stream. But you know, most importantly, I want to see people stick around um, regardless of however they're feeling. But if you are having thoughts of, you know, not wanting to be here, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing to be ashamed about, you know. And I'd rather we know as professionals that you're going through that so we can get on top of it. And we can come in with the happiness and hopefully I can maybe I can hold a class and teach everybody's doctors how to do the dance. And maybe that might help out. But, um, you know, people, regardless of wherever you're going through, uh, you know, you matter. And you're worthy of a love, attention, and respect. All right. So let me see. Um, postpartum is right. That's correct. Um, and um, all right. So let's talk about postpartum depression, right? So I think postpartum depression is, it, there's no depression that's like, oh, yes, I got the good kind of depression, right? But postpartum depression can be very frustrating because uh, you may feel isolated and you may feel there's a lot of guilt that comes with being a, a, a new parent, right? And being a new mother and having all these responsibilities. And sometimes you feel like you're not doing the best for your child, right? So when you're not happy, right? And you're having a new life to care for, it can be very difficult, right? Because if your self-care is not where it needs to be and you're isolating yourself and you're not showering, you're not eating, you're not in the best position to take care of other people, including your child, right? But uh, postpartum depression is a serious thing. And even with depression and postpartum period, there've been women who have reported uh, depressive symptoms for up to three years after having a baby. So this is something that is no joke and needs to be talked about. And this is one of the reasons why I do like the internet, you know, because you'll hop on a, a Facebook, right? Or you'll hop on a Instagram or TikTok or whatever, um, uh, you know, social uh, media platform. And you'll see, you can type in postpartum depression and you'll see women talking about their struggles and talking about the fact that they felt ashamed to come forward because a lot of people are, you know, bringing you gifts for the baby and people just don't see it coming that you're not happy, right? So just having a safe space where it's okay to talk about these things, I think that goes a long way. Of course, it's not professional help. It doesn't put you in the seat of a therapist, but I think those small things go a long way, go a long way. All right, and um, let me see what um, Kendra was saying. I had the same experience. I was overly protective of, over my son. I'm currently pregnant. Oh, you, you tell us you're, whoa, 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 whoa. You didn't tell us you're pregnant. Mickey Thicky. Wow. Whoa, 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 whoa. Pause. Slow your roll. Congratulations. Congrats. I love the show. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I'll need to know when you, you have your, uh, 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 your kid. I, I got a special gift for you. Uh, and I appreciate the, the water jug you sent my way. 
Um, but let me continue reading. I got I got distracted. Sorry. I'm currently pregnant and can feel it happen again. So they have me on my depression medication so that we can uh, easier transition to having two children. Well, congratulations for for sh- thank you for sharing first and foremost, um, and and thank you for letting people see what it's like. Right, a lot of times people will say things like, and keep in mind, I, I can't tell you what to do medication wise. You have to talk to your provider. But um, like I've I've had patients who are pregnant and they were on medica- I had them on medications, um, and sometimes people think, oh, when you're pregnant, you don't have, you shouldn't take meds. There's different schools of thoughts for different things, right? But obviously, we should listen to our licensed healthcare professional. Uh, but sometimes you will have someone who's pregnant and on medication because when you weigh the risk and the benefit, you may say, "Oh, it's it's, it's worth it to you know to to go this way or to go that way." You know, so if that's what you have to do to take care of yourself, then there should be no shame about it. Even though sometimes we do feel kind of guilty, or we we may feel um, ashamed for whatever reason, but there's no shame in you know, going through these things because you're trying to do the best for not only yourself, but the, the life that you're going to bring into the world, you know? So thank you for sharing. I do appreciate you. Oh, she did. Oh no. Oh, oh, Mickey Ficky. Oh no. Oh my gosh. I got to look through the chat. Oh, Mickey Ficky. I didn't look at, ah, oh. what? No, 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 no. What? Congratulations. Congratulations. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> Wow, congrats. That's dope. Congrats. Wow. Congrats. Wow, wow, wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, let me read these two comments and uh uh oh, 35 minutes. Somebody can drop the magic word in, but let me read these comments in real quick. My daughter had postpartum depression with her first child at 15 and uh, has been depressed ever since. Um and are you had the postpartum depression with each of your kids? But you were horrible at self care. Um, but your husband, well, well, Archie, thank you for sharing first and foremost. And I am happy that you had a supportive spouse. I think that having a supportive partner or spouse uh, is a cheat code to life. And especially when you're going through things like postpartum depression, just having somebody there who doesn't judge you, uh, that goes a long way. Uh, thank you for sharing, Audrey. Yeah, it's, it's cool. And um, Sarah says, each pregnancy reacts different with women. I think that's why it's so hard to express our emotions because. You may experience new or different things and not understand why it didn't happen before. Yeah, I completely agree with everything that you said there. And, and and if you're one of those women that you're experiencing different things, please be kind to yourself and don't judge yourself just for what you're going through, right? Maybe it was, maybe your first two kids, you had no issues. And with this third child, for some reason, you, you just feel awful every day. Don't judge yourself, even though everything in your body is telling you to judge yourself. You know, you have to, like, work actively to not judge yourself. Um, my doctor had me on Wellbutrin while pregnant and started me on Zoloft within an hour after delivery on my second because the postpartum was so bad on my first. So, Rachel, thank you for sharing. And before we get to the water break, let me say something else. So this is why it's so good to, t- w- w- you know, you have a doctor and, you know, you're pregnant, you're talking to your OB. This is why it's so good to, you know, have a provider that listens and also is important for us to speak up and tell our doctors what's going on, right? Because if you've had an experience the first time around, you can tell your doctor, hey, the last time I had a kid, I felt so awful. I didn't leave the house for three weeks. I stopped taking showers. I stopped eating. I lost a lot of weight. It was awful. Uh, Is there anything you can do to help me out? And Rachel, I'm not saying this is your situation, but I'm just making it up, right? But when you tell your doctor that, right, then they can go through all the options. Like, hey, you know, you know, we may go ahead and you know, preemptively put you on this or we'll, we'll put you on that or we'll watch you for a little bit. But as long as you tell your provider, you can have a game plan. Right. You know, when you're preparing for a, a match, a contest, a sporting event and there's no game plan, there's a good chance that you will lose to the other team. Right. So when you go and prepared, um, it makes it makes it makes all the difference. Honestly, I was going to say it makes a difference, but it makes all the difference. Right. All right. So now it's time for the water break. Yee! The water break is when we get a chance to drink some water because, uh, you know, sometimes we forget to stay hydrated throughout the day. So the water break will give us a chance to take in some fluids and make sure that we're staying hydrated, right? Very, very, very important. All right. So time for the water break. I like water, but, you know, whatever drink you have or, you know, tea or whatever you're sipping on, you don't have to tell me. But it's time for the water break. All right. Big cheers, everybody. Big cheers. 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 Whew. 
Hot water break was good. I needed that. Big cheers, big cheers. I needed that one. I needed that one. Ooh, big cheers. All right. Now it's time to talk about the um, fourth type of um, depression. But let me see what the uh, camera says. I didn't know I worked my stroller for about two months because I didn't leave the house without some. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you for sharing, uh, uh, Kendra. At first, I, I read I read it quickly. I thought you said you didn't know how to work your stroller. I'm like, oh, that's something that I would, you know, struggle with. But then I don't have any kids. So why, why would I know how to, you know, work a stroller, you know? But I, I could maybe look on YouTube, right? Um, and uh, all right. So the fourth type of depression that we should watch out for uh, is bipolar depression. All right. And this is one of the ones that for me uh, is well, bipolar disorder in general is sometimes hard for me to catch. Uh, more so bipolar two than bipolar one, um, but the bipolar depression, right? At least in my experience, and I've also read about this in school. A lot of times, when you come across a patient who is bipolar, right, in your office, we normally catch them in the manic phase of things, right? So we can, oh, we're like, oh, okay, they haven't been sleeping, they're talking fast, um, making questionable decisions. Um, the max out the credit card, driving fast or whatever. Um, uh, and it's been going on for maybe at least a week or a couple of weeks, right? And you look through all the criteria, like, you know, okay, this person has bipolar disorder, cool, right? So you put them on um, you know, mood stabilizers, maybe antidepressants, and then you hope that the patient is doing well, right? But when you catch somebody at the opposite spectrum, right? It's frustrating, at least for me, right? It's frustrating for me because let's say you have somebody who has bipolar disorder and they're sitting in your chair, right? But they appear depressed. If you don't ask them enough questions as a provider or if they don't give you enough information or let's say they can't, they don't know their history and you don't have enough collateral information, you might be looking at somebody, right? And then like we talked about in the beginning of the live stream, right? You may see somebody have the classical uh, symptoms of uh, um depression and um sarah i'll explain this in just one second right one second but you may see somebody with the classical symptoms of depression right not eating not sleeping or eating too much uh, sleeping too much um losing interest in activities that they used to enjoy doing isolating themselves maybe um overworking maybe uh relying on substances um your memory is struggling right let's see you, you see all these things right as a provider you're, you're like oh this person's depressed cool I'm going to give them an antidepressant, right? But if they have bipolar disorder and you did not know that, you may put them into mania, right? So you may accidentally do something that was meant to help them out, but you may have pushed them into a manic episode, right? So you thought you were fixing one problem or you fixed one problem, right? But you created another, right? So that's why bipolar depression can be difficult to catch, right? Um, or bipolar disorder in general. But that's why it's so important to get a good detailed history um, and if, let's say you give somebody an antidepressant and, you know, they become manic and you're like, oh, they have bipolar disorder, you would adjust their diagnosis and then maybe give them a mood stabilizer as well. So that, that way they're not going straight into mania, right? So that's why you have to, you know, um, you gotta be a student of the game. You really have to pay attention to these things and be a good listener as a healthcare provider. But we also do rely on the patients to give us that information so we know what we're doing. But bipolar depression... Um, can be frustrating because, you know, with depression, you know, what do we do for it? We use therapy and medications. Seems relatively straightforward. Of course, having a good um, uh, support system is helpful. Having people that love you is helpful. Having um, positive self-talk, all that's helpful, right? But with bipolar depression, you may not want to give an antidepressant. Or if you do that, you normally give a mood stabilizer. These are very, very, very important things because, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're like, ah, I don't get it. But if if you know, you know, right? Maybe from personal experience or maybe from, you know, a habit to family member. Uh, but if you know, you know, it's very important to identify uh, whether it's regular depression or bipolar depression because the medication choice is going to be very important. You know, so these are things that maybe the average person doesn't know, but, um, you know, I sit there and I try to figure out um, interesting ways to, to, to put this into a video so we can get the, the message out to the public. Uh, and let me talk about this real quick. So, uh, Sarah, bipolar one disorder, uh, with bipolar one, you don't have to have a depressive episode, right? Even though a lot of people would. 
bipolar one disorder do have depressive episodes, right? But you can be you can have bipolar one disorder without ever having had a depressive episode as long as you have a, a manic episode, right? So if you have a manic episode where let's say you've gone days without sleeping, you're talking fast, making questionable decisions, um, and it you qualify for a manic episode and it's been at least a week, right? Then you are bipolar one, right? Or if you land in the psychiatric hospital before a week has gone by because of mania, we go ahead and automatically call it bipolar one disorder, right? Um, and that's for safety purposes. But with bipolar two, you don't have that full-blown mania, right? We have something that we call hypomania. So it's like, it's like a, a, a baby mania, right? You're still manic, but you're kind of more manageable. So you can, you can go to work, you can go to uh, school, you can go to church, you know, you can hang out with the boys, you can hang out with your girls, and people may not really catch it, but people may notice that, hmm, this person's talking a little faster than they normally talk, right? Or this person's not really sleeping that like they used to sleep, or they have a decreased need for sleep, right? And they still feel amazing. Or this person's kind of spending a lot of money, more money than they have, kind of mass maxing out your credit card, you know, here and there. Um, so bipolar depression, you have like a, like a, an abbreviated form of mania, which we call hypomania, right? But with, um, no, with bipolar two, right? But with bipolar two, you also have to have a depressive episode, right? So whereas in bipolar one, you don't necessarily have to have a depressive episode, but with bipolar two, you do have to have a depressive episode and you have to have hypomania, but not quite the full blown mania. So it can be hard to, in my opinion, if you ask me the, the most difficult condition to diagnose in my whole career is probably bipolar two for all the reasons that I just said. Right. And um, like, as I'm talking, I'm thinking to myself, I hope this makes sense because it took me a long time for me to, you know, for this to click. So that's why if somebody asks me this question next week, I'll answer again. And, you know, maybe the more I talk about it, I can figure out ways for it to maybe make sense. Right. Um, and um, let me see. Can't that go ADHD? Uh, yes, but ADHD, there's no manic episode in ADHD. There's no mania in ADHD at all. There's no mania in ADHD at all. Uh, it, may, you may, it may look like it's mania, but it's not, unless you have ADHD and also um, bipolar disorder. Um, okay. Oh, oh, all right, okay. So, so Sarah does understand what I'm talking about. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Awesome. And let me look at uh, the... Um, so real quick, let me talk about this. Uh, there's a lot of research coming out about psilocybin, you know, uh, that's actually encouraging. It's actually encouraging. So people talk about microdosing and and and, and mushrooms and, and this, that, and the third, but there's actually some encouraging evidence uh, about psilocybin. So I'll, I'll be keeping an eye on that um, and talking to uh, my OGs, you know, the psychiatrists who I rely on for education and instruction. Um, but yeah, it seems to be encouraging at this point. And... Um, that miss uh so Ricky Bell, my favorite. I, I it, it depended on the patient. It really depended on the patient. Cause I used to back at the psych hospital, we would prescribe Zyprexa a lot, you know, and I thought Zyprexa was helpful for a lot of our patients, but then you know, sometimes you know it makes you put on weight. So we would switch to something else. So I can't really pick like one medication that was the best. Some patients did well with Zyprexa, some did well with Limeto. Some did well with geodon, some did well with lithium, you know, but uh, the evidence, if like, if you're a junkie, where's my DSM-5, you know, it's not there when I need it, right? Uh, but this wouldn't be in a DSM-5 anyway, but uh, the evidence shows that, you know, medications like lithium can be very, very helpful, um, you know, and also speaking of lithium, it has a protective factor against suicide. A lot of folks don't know that. So sometimes you may be depressed and your doctor may add lithium to your medications and you don't have bipolar disorder. So these meds are all, it's, it's, it's kind of like a game that you're playing, um, not with the patient, but with the meds, trying to like, kind of like your mad scientist, just trying to figure out like what works the best, right? Um, and yes, not medical advice. This is educational purposes only. It really is just me and the 68 people online right now and the folks watching um, after the fact. We're just hanging out. And we're just talking and we're just chilling. That's that's what we're doing. We are just chilling. Jenna, what's up? What's up? How are you doing? All right. Um, so all right, so real quick, let's we talked about the four types of depression to watch out for. Uh, and how can we, you know, um help with depression, right? Obviously, having a good support system is helpful. 
Positive self-talk is helpful. Uh, exercise is helpful. Doing your best to sleep at around the same time every night and wake up around the same time every night is helpful. We have to get sleep. Too much sleep is a bad thing, right? But you have to get sleep. You know, I like to get around that seven, eight hour range. Um, and also the most important thing, the thing that I have to say, you know, is there's no shame in reaching out to a healthcare professional or a doctor um, and getting some further guidance. Because sometimes therapy may be warranted. And sometimes, even though people hate to hear it, uh, there's just no way around medications, you know? Like sometimes you'll go in and you may have somebody who's severely depressed and you may just have to do medications. I know a lot of folks don't want to hear that because people are like, oh, what are some non medicate you know? And of course, like I can't, you know, I can't, I can't tell you all what medications to take via like a Facebook live stream. Uh, but sometimes in order to feel your best, uh, medications may be required. And if you go to the doctor, or your therapist, and they, you know, prescribe you medications. If you're one of those folks who has to take medications to feel your best, there should be no shame in doing that, you know. Um, and I, I think it's important to say that. So I hope that, you know, I know this is towards the end of the live stream, but the people who are watching the playback, I hope that y'all make it to this point where, and I, I think I've said it before in the live stream, but I hope you all make it to the point where, like right here at the 50 minute mark, where you understand and you can hear me clearly saying that if you have to take medications, um, do not feel bad about it. And you may not have to take them for the rest of your life, right? Some people take it, them for extended periods of time. Some folks, like I said, will take it for a couple of months to get through the winter. Um, some women with uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder may take some antidepressants throughout the month or only on certain weeks, right? So it's all different. It's just about making it work for you. You know, it's not about giving you pills to make the companies rich. Not nah, it's about figuring out what works for you, you know? So I think that's very important. All right. And um, let me see. Um, uh, Angelina, I feel uh, I am open-eyed and aware of this. It's a scary. Not... Yeah, it, so um, Angelina, look, all of this is scary, right? Especially if it's your first time, you know? But that's why it's very helpful to have First of all, a provider who is you know empathetic and who wants to listen to you, wants to listen to you, right? But also having a support system of people around you who don't make you feel bad for doing what you have to do to take care of yourself, you know? All right. So I do want to um, say that. So, uh, all right. Uh, I do have to let me see. Okay. All right. Get back to my publicist. All right. So I do have to uh, get going. But this is a really good live stream, and we will definitely be um, uh, rolling on Thursday night, 6 o'clock on the West Coast, 9 o'clock on the East Coast, for the next segment of Late Night with Dr. Kodro. And I do apologize for missing Monday's live stream. I got to get my uh, schedule together. You know, may have to do some traveling, and we got a lot going on, but this is a priority to me. And uh, it's, it's, it's a blessing to be able to have this platform uh, and I'm, I'm super grateful for each and every one of, of you all. I love your questions. I love the interaction. I love the feedback. Uh, and it means a lot to me that I get to, to go live. Uh, it means a lot to me that I get to post uh, videos for you all. Um, and also on Friday, I will be releasing a video about bipolar depression, right? So that was the last type of depression that we spoke about. Um, but I will post that video on Friday. Um, the video is called, I'll go ahead and tell you about the video because I'm getting excited about it. But the video is called, Friday Night Blues, and it's a super short film about bipolar depression. So that comes out on Friday, uh, and I'm excited for you all to see that. And hopefully you can relate to it. Um, hopefully you laugh a little bit because I try to make it funny, but you know, most importantly, hopefully that video brings some value to you um, and helps you out. So uh, until the next time, which is Thursday, y'all have a fantastic night. Take care. I love each and every one of you all, and see y'all soon. Yeah.